Now we're going to talk a little about ideal gases. Many of you have probably encountered ideal gases in other courses, again, probably a chemistry course. And the ideal gas model is very, very simple. You have your molecules or atoms, gas particles, I guess is the generic way of saying that, in some container. There are probably more than four, but we're just going to stick with a few. Uh, and they have some velocities going in different directions. Who knows? And the only things that we need to know about these particles in order to derive the ideal gas law is, is very simple. Number one, they do not collide with each other. They do not, they are, and they are not attracted to each other. Uh, they exist kind of independently of their neighbors, so the behavior of the ideal gas um, you know, does not depend on any particular interactions between any of the particles in there. It requires that energy is conserved, so that if one particle loses energy, uh, it is either losing it to somewhere outside the chamber, or it is losing it to one of its neighbors, and therefore its neighbor gained the energy. Uh, or or excuse me, wrong conjunction. And lastly, momentum is conserved. So when one of these molecules strikes the wall of the chamber and bounces off, uh, momentum is conserved, which tells us something about the force that that particle exerts on the wall. We're not going to derive it. This is pretty rigorously derived in uh, any physical chemistry textbook for sure. If you're interested, um, I'm happy to talk about it, but we're not gonna need it for, for this class. Uh, so, to describe our ideal gas, we only need a few variables. So we don't need to worry about what the velocities of all those particles are. Like I said, we have these macroscopic variables we can use. And for a thermodynamic system like this, uh, these are called state variables. Uh, so these are Those that com those meaning those variables that completely specify the state of the system. Different systems have different state variables. We're just talking about the state variables for an ideal gas. That's what we're about to about to write down. So those variables are the following. We've already seen them all. The volume. The number of particles, either written in terms of moles or in terms of the actual, you know, number of particles, uh, the temperature, and the pressure. So, uh, these are our, <laughs> these are our four state variables for a, for an ideal gas. These are not independent of one another, uh, meaning that if we change one of them, at least one or more of the other ones also have to change. And, uh, and another way we can, we can put that is uh, we, we cannot specify all four variables. We only need three of these to describe the state of our gas. Once we have decided what the values of three of them are, the value of the fourth one uh, can be calculated from that. All right, so there is a long storied history of ideal gases and the, the you know, derivations of the behavior, um, Boyle and Gay-Lussac and you know, many other uh, chemists and physicists. And the result of that was, is the following equation, which you have almost certainly seen before, PV equals nRT, so this is the ideal gas equation of state. And because I think it's interesting, this was first written down in this form around 1834, um, which is almost 200 years ago, uh, which, is, which is a long time. So this tells us the relationship between the pressure, the volume, the amount of stuff, and the temperature. The only thing we 
The only unfamiliar piece here is this capital, capital R. So this is uh, the universal gas constant. The reason this is the universal gas constant is because you can also write this equation such that um, instead of the number of moles, you have the mass of your system, and the trade, which is very convenient if you're doing calculations for actual systems. Uh, but then the trade-off is your value of R depends on what stuff you're talking about. So then you have a different gas constant for air versus oxygen versus argon, etc. So um, the universal gas constant that we that is in terms of moles uh, has the following value: eight point three one joules per mole Kelvin. So note on the left side of the equation here, P times V, if these are in SI units, P in Pascals times V volume in cubic meters, uh, this is equal to joules. I didn't explicitly say that, but we also could have seen that when we were doing our, um, doing our fluid stuff in the last chapter. So anyway, PV gives us joules on this side, Joules per mole Kelvin times moles times Kelvin gives us joules on the right side. So just checking our units never hurts. Uh, some of you may have seen the universal gas constant written in different units, like liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin or something like that. Uh, we're only going to do joules per mole Kelvin, so use 8.3, not 0 0.08, whatever it is. All right, uh, so... And we'll erase that. It is, it is going to come up where we are not worrying about the number of moles in our system, but we are, mo we are worried about the number of particles in our system, actually talking about, oh, we have 10 to the 20 particles in our ideal gas or something like that. So we can rewrite this equation in terms of capital N, the number of particles, and that looks like this. And when we do that, there is a different constant that goes in here, K sub B. This is Boltzmann's constant. Which some of you may have seen before. Um, so Boltzmann's constant is, you can kind of figure out if we're going from number of moles to number of particles. There's an Avogadro's number in there somewhere. So Boltzmann's constant is just the ideal gas constant divided by Avogadro's number, which is equal to 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Boltzmann's constant, it turns out, is the... I'm going to claim a more fundamental constant of the of the universe um, compared to the ideal gas constant, which involves this definition of moles, which is, you know, kind of made up. Uh, so, so I would argue that this is the the more fundamental ideal gas equation, and Boltzmann's constant is the more um, the more fundamental of the units. Boltzmann's constant shows up a million other places in physics, and the biggest reason for that is if you have a bunch of particles that are at some temperature, uh, the details of this are going to change slightly from system to system, but that temperature times Boltzmann constant, so K times T, this is something like the energy that each of those particles has. So if we are at uh, I'm, I'm going to pick around number, 1,000 Kelvin. If we're at 1,000 Kelvin, 1,000 times this is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 20 joules, and our Kelvins cancel. So each particle in our system of gas, of solid, or whatever, uh, at 1,000 Kelvin is going to have its individual kinetic energy roughly equal to, or you know, kinetic or potential, or its total energy roughly equal to uh, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 20 joules. Narrator Will here, stepping in for a moment. When I said that the kinetic energy of each particle would be kT, what I should have said was that the 
average energy of each particle will be kT. Many, many particles will have more, many, many particles will have less, but on average, they will have the value kT. So, Boltzmann's constant is important. It tells us this relationship between energy and temperature for any system. Lastly, for most of the stuff we're doing in 210, uh, we are going to have our systems be fixed uh, with regard to the number of particles in them. So we are not going to be allowing particles to enter or leave our ideal gas system, which means n and n, number of moles or number of particles, are both constant. So if we start out with 10 moles of stuff, we're going to end up with 10 moles of stuff. We're not, um, we're not interested in, you know, flow of particles in or out of our system the way we might be in some other classes. So uh, what that means is we can write our, well, let's go back to our ideal gas law just for a second. So if N is staying the same and K is staying the same, that means if we divide both sides by T, T over T cancels. That means this PV over T is staying constant no matter what we do to our system as long as we're not changing the number of particles. So we can write that as P initial V initial over T initial equals P final V final over T final. This is very useful in looking at transformations of our ideal gas as we increase its temperature and decrease its pressure or you know, things, things of that sort. All right, so that is all the stuff about ideal gas I wanna talk about today. Uh, next time we're gonna talk about ideal gas processes, so what we can actually you know, look at some examples of doing the things to ideal gases and the, and the consequences of that.